When you're talking about history and the way people thought kind of like a whole, sometimes it's hard to describe. And it, it's really hard to describe if you're in the middle of it and there's big things happening in the world and, and global thought is, is going a certain way. But as you come out of that time period, you turn around and you look back at it, you can see some certain trends and you can see some certain things that characterize that time period. In the Baroque time period, people were um, under the rules of like kings and despots and everybody was trying to show their power. As far as kings and queens, they were trying to show their power by how fancy they made everything. And people suffered under this kind of rule because kings and queens would need money for the kind of showing off they needed to do with their palaces and their clothes and their hairdos and their big, huge, fancy feasts. And the people, they would take money from the people to fund those things. Well, you can imagine people would get kind of tired of that, especially if you're, you know, poor and you're having to work hard in this palace and your family doesn't have enough food. And you're seeing that the king has way too much food. Wouldn't you get tired of that? Well, the people in the classical period, and we call this the classical period because they started looking back at the classics, like Greek and Roman ideals, they started thinking, well, what if we could have democracy and fairness and equality? And that led to some big revolutions. The Americans were saying, hey, how come we have to pay taxes to that king over there across the Atlantic Ocean, um, but we don't get to have a voice in his government? They got really mad, and they, they had a big war, and they threw him off. France was over there busy taking notes. They're like, hey, if America can do it, we should be able to do it too. So they did it. They, they chopped the head off their king. And then they had this, you know, it was terrible turmoil and upheaval, but um, it, it was, you know, it was, <laughs> it was messy. We'll just put it that way. Um, but they were busy thinking about, hey, how did the Greeks do it? There was a lot of writings that they found, and there was some people digging around in Greece. And there was a deepened interest because of some discoveries um, in archaeology. They're like, hey, there was these civilizations that we got to learn more about. What did they say? What did they think? They had some writings, they had some speeches, they had poetry. And uh, the, Greece, the Grecians, like 2,000 years before that, they weren't like really stable themselves, but um, they had a lot of thoughts about people voting for their rulers instead of the rulers just being born into it, just because they were born into it. Um, people here, this is called an age of reason. Um, people were valuing human intelligence rather than just one person being born into a position of ruling and power. They thought people should be ruling because they're intelligent, not just because they're born that way. Um, okay, so during the classical period, there were three main composers that uh, dominated this period. It's not a very long period. Um, but there were three particular geniuses that we remember now. Of course, there were other composers too, but um, Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven are the three that we're going to remember here. During this time, since they were thinking a lot about you know Greek ideals, they also reflected um, something about their clothing and their hairstyles. This is actually a pretty Greek hairstyle on this girl, and her, her dress looks kind of like a, a Grecian pillar. Um, they were moving away from the rich opulence of the Baroque, period that I'm sitting on. Everything was super fancy and ornate, but over here the, the lines get quite a bit cleaned up. And you'll notice that during this time period, some of the famous buildings that look like they're Greek are like the, the, like the White House and the Capitol building. Those are, those are Greek architecture, and those kinds of lines were super popular in, in, in buildings. So in the late 1700s, there's so many clean lines and, and square windows and balance for example, there's a triangle on top of this, and there's a dome here, and there's a triangle here, and a dome here, and a triangle there, and a dome there. You can actually hear that in Mozart's sonatas. It's like this. Da 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 so uh, balance and elegance and simplicity and harmony, those were the ideals. Now how did they, how did they know how Greek music sounded? Because they wanted to emulate that. Well, they didn't. They didn't have any recordings, but the Greeks, they wrote about how music should be balanced and elegant and light and simple. So the people here were like, oh, hey, let's scrap out that crazy Baroque ornate um, trills and stuff. We'll get rid of some of that. And 
we'll keep our music that way too. So it went from very polyphonic, thick, many melodies all at once, like so thick and hard to understand, to like a right hand melody and a left hand harmony. It's very simple. The colors um, and the fashions were beautiful, light, fresh, white, clean lines, neoclassical architecture, think Grecian pillars, etiquette, very fine manners. So let's get a little into a little bit about the people, like the, the composers here. Here's Franz Joseph Haydn, and he was um, <laughs> he was elegant, delightful, and ready to play tricks on people. If you look at some stories in his life, they're actually pretty funny. He was very poor and on his own when he was a little kid, but he has he has such a good attitude about everything that he made a lot of friends. So his friends would support him, and um, he was a clever composer, and he played a lot of tricks on people. One time the king was like, the prince that he worked for, was like, no, you guys can't go on a vacation. You have to stay here and work for my, for my, you know, for my next party. But he wrote a symphony where the composers blow out their candles on their music stands and walk, pack up their bags, and one by one they walk out, and there's like only two violins left playing. And the, the prince is like, ah, fine, go have your holiday. <laughs> And he is saying, won't the prince jump at the huge chord in the quiet movement? I can't wait to see his face. And this is a, kind of typical of the slightly subversive trick playing Haydn's, you know, it's like the people were kind of poking fun at the aristocracy. And he writes this beautiful, quiet piece for the prince, and right in the middle when the prince should be falling asleep, he writes this huge explosive chord. <laughs> and so... It, it's a little bit of it's a little bit of a, a commentary on what people were thinking about kings. They weren't afraid to play tricks on them. So um, you can listen to that if you want to listen to that symphony. It's called the Surprise Symphony, and it's in the quiet second movement. You'll hear that giant chord. Here's Mozart as a very small child. How he is very famous for being remembered as a as a child prodigy. This could possibly be his older sister saying, now hold still, Wolfie. It doesn't matter if the curls in your wig are a little loose. Here, let me give you some more powder. And he's freaking out. He's like, ah, no, I can't go on this way. My wig is not just perfect. And it's true. He panicked if his wig was not just perfect when he was six years old. And his father put him in a carriage like this, a stagecoach. And they traveled and traveled all over Europe from palace to palace. And they pretty much treated him like a little puppet or a monkey and how they watched him perform. His father was a very wise teacher, very uh, gifted musician, his father himself. But when he gave, you know, <laughs> he gave an education, a uh, really high quality education to this totally genius little kid, it was a really nice match between the two of them. However, um, Wolfgang Amadeus's father, um, in a sense you could say he sort of exploited him too. Um, but back in those days, you're like, well, what else would you do? I mean, it's like you had to make a living, and you had this total genius, and then there's these kings and queens ready to give great rich gifts. Um, but at the same time, you're like, well, the poor kid, like half the time he's sick, and he's having to ride in a stagecoach without any heat. And Mozart himself wrote about that. He wrote, that carriage jolted the very souls out of our bodies, and the seats were as hard as stone. For two whole stages, I sat with my hands dug into the upholstery, and my backside suspended in the air. November 8, 1780. Imagine traveling without pneumatic tires. That means blow-up tires. These are like hard tires. Over cobblestone roads across Europe. And so you want to keep in mind that this was a really uncomfortable ride. <laughs> okay, so um, when Mozart grew up, he had a hard time making money because his father had controlled his life so much previously. He didn't give him much freedom to figure things out on his own. And when he did try to figure things out, he wasn't very good at them. He was just really good at making music. That was about it. There are many princes and noblemen, says Beethoven. There is only one Beethoven. Well, now that comment really embodies the ideology of this time period as it was changing. Uh, Beethoven is kind of like as a, he's like an hourglass, middle of the hourglass figure. If everything before music was this, is one way, there's Beethoven, everything after music, after Beethoven changes, everything. He changed everything. He was the first successful freelance composer where he's like writing his own stuff for his own artistic gratification and rejecting um, people wanting to patronize him to the degree where they're always commanding him what to write. Um, 
they, this this comment came after somebody noble invited him, sent a tele, you know, not a telegram, sent a, like a message by messenger, and his friend said, Mr. Beethoven, are you not going to accept this great offer? Because the king is like, oh, tomorrow night you can come play for us in the palace. And he's like, eh, there's a great many princes and noblemen, but there's only one of me. And he was right. He knew who he was. And that was actually really difficult for him because knowing who he was and what great gift he had, he had a very large sense of self and when he started losing his hearing he's like wait why me you know why this gifted beethoven why why should i be the one to lose my hearing and it really caused a huge internal struggle for him and losing his hearing wasn't just things going quiet it was this huge terrible roar and zinging and you know clinking and crashing sounds in his ears sometimes it was so unbearable he would just grab his head and just you know, he would cry and shriek with agony in his ears. It was horrible, really horrible. And people talking with him, sometimes they were like trying to communicate with him and he wouldn't answer back and they didn't know why because he wouldn't tell people that he was losing his hearing. He would just be like, you know, I don't want them to know because if they think I'm a composer that can't hear, they're not going to believe in me anymore. So... The interesting, the very interesting life. If you read more about Beethoven, I think you'll be fascinated because he, he just, he had a huge struggle. He overcame, but his most famous pieces, like Ode to Joy, um, he never heard that. He wrote it, but he never heard it. He could imagine it, but he never heard that. Opus 109, that beautiful piano sonata, he never heard that. You should listen to it. Sonata in E major. Opus 109. It's amazing. Beethoven could not convince any lady to marry him. He was so, he was stormy, messy, not always considerate of people's feelings, and he was going deaf. Also, he was considered a commoner. There was a lady that he loved, and she wouldn't marry him because if she would marry him, she was noble and he was a commoner, and if she would marry him, it was law that her kids to, would be taken from her. So he, he chafed against those ideas. He's like, why am I not noble just because I'm not born that way? He says, nobility is in our t intelligence and in our ideals and in our art. Nobility is not because you're born one way. So, um, and he, he, he was probably one of the people that kind of helped change those ideals because in himself, he had himself in high esteem. He's like, I am noble because of my art. I am noble because who I am, not because I'm born a certain way. But the lie did not agree, <laughs> not at that time. Things have changed, and they always change.